Yeah. I'm gonna buy that one and that one. All of it. I need it all. Do you want it though? Where do I begin? I see the hate, they don't wanna see me win. Bank deposits, I got more coming in. Top down, throw the money in the wind. I don't want it all. Heard these scammer, I had to switch up the accounts. Moving paper, gotta call it my account. It's all in, I can't have it coming out. Been through the struggle, I can see another drought. Yeah, it's not a purse, it's a merch. Six figures, what's the gold? Now it's nine, no, I heard. Put it work. Used to pull up, not swerve, no time for the snake. Hey guys, welcome to another session of Educators Roundtable. You know, in this day and age, and not because I have an IT company, but because it's very important we start looking at things, not for this moment, but where we're going in the future, not just with education, but with careers. So right now there's a huge demand for IT support all over the world. So you begin to ask yourself these questions. If our students were graduating today in this moment, in May is at this moment, would they prepare to walk into positions in IT? The question is probably not. So tonight, we're gonna talk to a person that not only can help your students get the IT training they need, but they can get it within the next six months to a year, walk out with a certification and start a job immediately. So. If you're not tuning in right now, or you know someone that needs to be tuning in right now, I suggest you send them the link because this is a very important show. We're going to talk about how do you take the youth of today and transition them into positions that will be gainfully employable for them tomorrow. And that means what? Financial stability for our students who are currently at risk of not being employed. So, of course, you know, we have my co-host. So, Shannon, how are you today? Pretty phenomenal, Birdcat. Thank you so much for caring enough to ask. How are you? I'm doing great. This is like a super awesome Wednesday. Okay. So my thoughts on Wednesday is one, I'm always excited because I get to see you. Um, but I think because I get to see you, we get to do this podcast and talk about relevant issues, you know, for students in general, but education hot topics. So, I mean, since we start doing this podcast, I mean, what have been your thoughts on the topics that we covered and the things that we've been doing? So um, to be clear, I schedule my entire week around this time. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a big deal. So, I mean, I, yeah, it's a huge thing. Um, I, I think these are, and in, in, in going back to the question that you asked, I think yeah. that these conversations are essential and the information that's being made available um, is, is potentially life-changing for folks that are listening and that share it. Well, thank you so much. And you know what? I love it that I really, just to give me that concept or that thought that you wrap your whole world around me and watching this makes me feel it, so much better. Well, 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 well not, not you, um, <laughs> but this one hour. <laughs> just this one hour. Just this one hour. One so hour. if you guys have missed prior episodes, you guys may not know, but Shannon and I are really good friends and we know each other. So this is him teasing me because <laughs> I'm always on top and about, dude, what are you doing? Like, you know, and so he's teasing me right now. So listen, I don't want to hold up our guests because we have an amazing guest and we have Dr. Spinelli joining us today. How are you? It's an absolute pleasure to be with both of you guys <laughs> my evening. <laughs> See, you know what? That's what I'm talking about. You see how that embracing, warm no. welcome. It was warm. Really? And it, and it was authentic as well. It was so authentic. No, I felt it. I felt it. <laughs> so, Dr. Sonelli, I want to thank you for coming on Educators Roundtable. You know, um, you've been in education for how long? Oh my, if I told you how many years, it would, it would reveal a number that you might not be ready for, but it's been a long time. Okay, so can we say like 30 plus years? Plus incredible years, yes. Okay, so in 30 plus years, when you talk about the transition of education, do you think we're taking education in the right direction? Or do you think there's some more work we need to do because about being career ready? Like at this point, when our when our students leave high school, they graduate from high school, they should either be going in a path that's going to take them to college or some type of training program or directly to work. Right. 
Um, do you think right now our education platform is doing that for us, for our students, the infrastructure we currently have in place? Or do we need some enhancements there? The answer to that question is highly contingent upon zip code. So if you're in Seattle, Washington, that there are all kinds of virtual right. programs, all kinds of IT programs for kids, and they actually get these credentials work while mm -hmm. they're in high school. But if you want to come into the inner city and you wonder if they exist, they might. But in the world of IT credentials, that's the ticket to the work world to earn a salary over $50,000. So outside of that, Sorry. like just, just speaking in education in general, do you think we are preparing our students to take one of those three paths right now outside of IT? We are not. We are not. <laughs> that made it simple. All right, so Shannon, what about you? Do you think? <laughs> you, you know my you know my position on this. Uh, <laughs> I'm in agreement with Dr. Spinelli. We are not. Okay. We are not. And so when we when we talk about education and where we at where we're at overall, um, do you guys think there's something that educators should be doing? Is it something that legislation should be doing? Should government be doing in order to ensure we are on the right track? So, so can I? I just want to kind of share this because I think um, educators are still taking this this historic approach um, to to really moving young people forward and preparing young adults. At this point, requires a different educational experience, a different mindset than it did a, a single generation ago, and too many students are not being meaningfully engaged and are not motivated in, in, in really what's going on in the classrooms because they're not being presented with uh, quality experiences in a traditional high school setting. And, and that that's especially true in the inner city. That you is, know, and I think I think you're right. And I apologize for interrupting. Um, R. Lee Gordon, thank you so much for joining us. Um, said exposure and experience. So honestly, well, I don't know, like, and so Dr. Spinelli, I'm not, I'm not going to throw you under the bus with the age thing, but I will say to you, uh, Shannon and I are, are like the same age. When we were in school, we were exposed to different things because we had CTE in our schools. It wasn't like we had to get on a bus and go somewhere. So our exposure to things were more immediate. I remember when we had home ec, a lot of people learned how to cook in school because we had home ec. We had so right? So, I mean, that has changed considerably. So for you, Dr. Spinelli, I mean, you've run school districts. So from an educator's perspective, from when you started to when you stopped and started your own company, do you think we made any shifts in the right direction to get our students more career ready or college ready? Well, I have to go. I have to be very personal with that response. So I've been a school superintendent, you know, teacher, all of that good stuff, and over on the IT side, the senior vice president, officer of major IT corporations. And so as an educator, because I've been back and forth, I've been able to think out of the box and do something different. For example, in Norfolk, when I was deputy superintendent there, I was able to open a school for high school dropouts. These are kids that had given up on school and pulled in the IT credentials as part of the offering. And these kids excelled and got their high school diploma. And so the expectation was they're gone, they can't. And my expectation was they will, they shall, they did. And so it's all about raising that bar of expectation and giving kids an opportunity that excites them that's outside of the norm. So you think it's more leadership because outside of that program that you brought to that district before you got there, were they doing anything innovative like that? No. Okay. So. I guess, you know, we think about the transition of education and that's why we talk about edu education equity and we're doing this series. That's what we're talking about because it took someone like you, an educator that was an out of a box thinker that brought something to that district that provided opportunities to employ students. And I think that's like rock star amazing. So now it makes us further want to push into who is the ed tech group? <laughs> Who is this ed? Because now, I mean, obviously you're the CEO. So who is the ed tech group? The ed tech group is a 501c nonprofit organization mm -hmm. in Virginia. And okay. we have licenses across the nation to do business uh, within the realm of education. We've had okay. contracts with state boards of education, with local boards of education, with school districts. 
And for example, Common Core, we've trained superintendents and teachers in over 47 states to help them understand the vertical and horizontal alignment of the curriculum so that they could launch Common Core, just as a for example. The main thing that we've done is use the power of data to affect change to grow achievement. When you're looking at numbers and statistics, they'll tell you whether or not you, you thought you taught a kid. Mm -hmm. The data says this. So let's do something different. And I've had a lot of success with that and really enjoy it. We do it under the auspice of principal as instructional leader. We have parent power, which gives parents information directed to their cell phone so that they can know what kids should learn with the links to help kids at home and what information they can help their kids with at home. And the virtual IT program is another biggie for us. I love that. So uh, Dr. Mason, thank you for joining us. She says Michigan's goal is the 60% by 2030 plan is to increase the number of working age students and adults with a skill certificate or college degree from 40% today to 60% by 2030. So that's like a big push. And I think that's huge. And um, Dr. Mason, thank you so much for sharing that with us. I mean, basically we're in 2022 now so by the time we get to 2030, at that point, we don't want to talk about how old I'll be, right? But the transition to get students to employable, I don't know, is there a way for us to increase that? And I think the question that I'm asking you, which will probably be the question I'm going to ask you two questions down from now, because I don't want to jump ahead and everybody miss, miss the meats and potato about who EdTech Group is. But I guess the core of the question is, you, you talked a little bit about this about how you support education initiatives. So I know like in the state of New York, you guys have a lot of initiatives, right, Shannon? Okay, you were asking about, uh, say it one more time because I think you just cut, cut off just a little bit. Oh, I, I apologize. No, I said in this, and we talk about education initiatives and I said in the state of New York, you guys have a lot of education initiatives across the board, things that you want to achieve within the first I think two to three years. Is I mean, like it's a lot. It's yeah, 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 for sure. Um, and and I think that's a that's a part of our our issue. Um, mm -hmm. it's a lot of initiatives. And Dr. Spinelli said something uh, a moment ago, and she was really speaking to analyzing data to really assess impact. And ultimately, the questions that every organization and entity should ask themselves is. Mm -hmm. Does the bottom line, which ultimately right. is the student and their quality of life, is it positively impacted by what we're doing, by our programming, by our actions? And if we can correlate what, what happens on the other side of this with, with, with our actions, then, then we have a positive match. And if not, we need to change course. But I don't think that enough of us are, are really intentionally thinking about the way that we use information to really take a look at our impact to determine that. Okay, Shannon, did you see how nice I was when I said you have a lot, a lot of initiatives? Oh, my God, because you guys do. Like, I read a lot of what goes in New York School District. I just want to say you guys got a lot, a lot of initiatives. <laughs> but, but, you know what? I, I will say this. And, and, yeah. and, and you know what? In, in defense of my, my awesome school district, uh, awesome. we have a lot of students. We have a lot of students. We, we have do. a lot of diversity. We, we are do. by far the largest in the nation. Yes. And, I mean, so, so just on that front. Um, the, 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 the size of the organization and the yes. needs of the stakeholders is huge. So it yes, is. while we do, but I think ultimately <laughs> we need to, to, to look at the data to determine the impact of our actions. And, and I say that because you guys are the largest school district in, in the United States, but I say that because we have school districts that are smaller than you that have the same amount of initiatives. But like you said, it boils down to the data. So Dr. Spinelli, you said it right on the button. We talk about initiatives and you gave us a little bit about this in, in a few minutes ago where you were talking about your programs and how you guys look at data to support academic growth in school districts. Can you give us a little more about that? Because that's a cute, that, that's like the major education initiatives that school districts should be focused on. So how do you guys help schools with that? Yeah, I'll give you one example. I had a contract <laughs> awarded uh, for Baltimore City Public Schools and uh, they actually brought me on as chief uh, of accountability right after that. There were four schools that were in program improvement and no one ever looked at statistics and data. And so within one year, we pulled them out of program improvement by using a power of data analysis of report card grades, which you might think might not be meaningful, but it really is. In algebra, for example, when you're comparing student performance against the norm, 
and 100% of the kids are failing algebra. It's not the kids. Right. A teacher has to do something to create success. But it's something we don't look, reading level placement, which is just really off the chain in urban education. You have kids right. in Title I that should be learning at grade level or above, and they're not. You got to be zone of proximal development. talks about delivering instruction in front of the curve. It takes a lot of nerve to deliver instruction in front of the curve. We don't have to remediate kids, you see, because when children sell drugs on the street, they do math, they don't make mistakes. When they sing rap songs, they know the meaning of that. You and I just may not know that. So right. we give them lots and lots of literature that they enjoy at grade level. They come along for the ride. And statistically, they do. Those four schools came out of program improvement in one year. There were other multiple, multiple wow. measure to attendance. Kids are coming, but the teachers aren't. That's a problem, you know? And so when you look at that data incrementally and your conversations and staff meetings are centered around the evidence of what kids can and cannot do, it becomes very purposeful. Mm -hmm. Teachers know what to do. And so they get busy. You don't have to tell them what to do. They've been, they, they're certified. But when you're looking at data and statistics, you can have a healthy conversation mm -hmm. and it's all about moving the child. It's not about lockers. It's not about discipline. Matter of fact, you have fewer discipline problems because kids are enjoying reading. They're enjoying math. They're enjoying what they're doing and they're successful. They should be. I love that. You know, I'm going to tell you right now, Shannon, that, you know, she, she has a passion um, for education. And I think you need that passion. I love it. And so I want to thank you so much for being so passionate about what needs to be done in education in order to move our student forward. Um, Jermaine, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, Shannon, he did a shout out to you as well. Good evening, uh, Jermaine. So Jermaine, I just want to say this. Why are you shouting out to Shannon? That's, what's going on it's, with that? It's Shannon, I, mean, every, I don't even know. Shannon, you have like this little cult following. No, no. These are good people who recognize good people. <laughs> like some cult okay. following or something. No, I don't even no, get that no. right. You know? No. Apple, Apple, Apple has a cult following. Like, <laughs> these people will stand in, fall, in line for the iPhone for days on end. I I am a person who good people can recognize as a good really? person. Really? You know what, Shannon? I, I love that. You you make me laugh. But Shannon does have his followers. When Shannon is out and something's happening, Christine, what's going on with Shannon? I'm like, oh, I can't believe this. So we talked about this a little bit earlier. I know for you and me, because we are in technology, we live and breathe it every day. But the question is, do you think K-12 education is preparing students for roles in, in tech? And so Shannon, I'll start with you because I know you guys have these amazing CTE programs in the state of, Mich I mean, the state of New York, where you guys are doing some ma major things there. So you wanna share some of that with us? Yeah, so um, ultimately uh, we, we are, and we have a number of programs that uh, students uh, that lead to certificates. But I would I would ultimately say the um, the higher level um, entry level IT piece is missing from our programs in general, and I think that it's something that's absolutely needed. Um, our IT, um, I'm sorry, our CTE programs are uh, very much in need of a refresh. And, and an update to, to meet market need. And so I would absolutely say that um, while there are great opportunities for students who participate, I think there's much greater ahead. Thank you, Shannon. Um, I also wanna make sure I don't forget to share this information. Um, he, Jermaine said hi to Dr. Spinelli as well. All about the equity, Jermaine. We so appreciate you. I just, I just want to throw that out. And so Dr. Mason says she agrees with Dr. Spinelli. She's absolutely correct. Many students do know how to use technology when it comes to their personal interests. 100% they do, and they use it all the time <laughs> to do things that maybe they should not be doing. So for you, Dr. Spinelli, I mean, we talked about this a little bit like a couple of days ago, we were talking about how students understand how to use tech. But when we made the transition to virtual platforms, 
they made it seem as if students weren't prepared for that. And I don't know if it was the students, the parents or the teachers or the school districts. Like, I don't know, but I definitely don't think it was our kids because they use their phone for everything. I mean, what's your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I had a conversation with Apple because so many millions of dollars were spent in New York City for with Apple. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, and my conversation with what the second person, second highest person in charge, I really took it to task. Because you don't just sell equipment when you have homeless children who are in homeless shelters, they have no access to the internet. You sold it with the intention of students being able to use it. So they got the technology, but they could not use the internal mm -hmm. internet to access the curriculum. Say it, it again, say it again, because she is so absolutely correct. And that was a huge issue. And it's one that has not been talked about so that yet, yeah, yes. Yes. They didn't like it one bit, Shannon. I really didn't care because I don't work for Apple. I care about kids. Yep. And I care. And when I was a senior vice president officer within the IT sector, matter of fact, we housed NAEP. So all of the program management for the U.S. Department of Education, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, we housed. I designed the very, very first high stakes online assessment for the state of Virginia. They're still using it. And as a vendor, if you want to call it, and I can be an educator in another realm, when you sell something, for kids, if they don't get the benefit, then I've got a problem if I sold it to you. And, and Apple really never owned that. That's a lot of technology for a school system to have to put in the hands of children for them to use. And so, you know, I don't know who wasn't ready. In my opinion, corporate America wasn't ready when they did it. And if I had been managing that program, every kid that had a computer would have been able to access it. It would have been very personal for me, but it was a sale for them. So, you know, the kids are ready. They you yeah, my son owns a huge IT company. He was taking stuff apart and putting it back together to avoid a spanking when he was seven, eight, nine. And I put him in technology class, you know. And so kids know technology. Pardon my excitement, but it's not the kids. No, I, I love it. I'm gonna tell you that's my company was hired because of the things that not only Apple did, but Microsoft did and several other companies, Dale and the rest of them. Um, they sent over their product and they didn't provide any type of online training. And that was a huge problem. Like they just dropped the product. But not only that, I think the person who ordered the technology for these school districts didn't take into account the homeless community. They didn't take into account that every home did not have Wi-Fi connectivity. So you should have been connecting yourselves with the local cable company or network systems to get the kids hotspots or to allow them to have access to your network through what? I mean, right now, if you're working from home, you can access your work server. So this was a lot of things that people should have thought about. But for me as an IT consulting firm, one of the things I said to all the school districts, can we please set up a private YouTube channel so I can help you create training videos just for your students and your parents? Because that would have made more sense. And if, you, if you're troubleshooting because you're having a problem connecting to this platform, Step one, step two, step three. And if this doesn't work, call this call, call this 1-800 number to our, you know, customer service or IT support and we will assist you. But they didn't do any of that. They just, kids showed up to the buildings, they gave them the devices and was like, good luck. I'll just say that I was deserve better. And so who does that? And, you know, and, and I'm going to tell you the flip side of that for teachers was that they were never taught how to teach to 10 kids in the classroom and 20 kids at home. So they were trying to figure out how to make this technology work and how to set up their classrooms and how to do it from home. Again, a private YouTube channel with a tutorial. If you're going to teach from home during the pandemic, this is what you need and this is how you set it up, right? If you don't have these items, please contact your school IT person and they can assist you, right? It should have been an order form that you could have ordered whatever you needed to do your teaching from home or how to set up your classroom in the classroom. So you're right. It was a lot of balls drop, I think, during this transition. But I don't think it was the kids because uh, uh, kids, the kids, uh, I think there was a class I went to where the English teacher had to tell them stop using short uh, slang for English content <laughs> because they were texting and tweeting, which is a whole different conversation. OK, guys, so you guys know we have to take a commercial break. So give us a moment. We'll be right back to Educators Roundtable. You're like 
like a circle that floats around me, keeping me safe and sound. And when I fall, you tied a rope to me. You're blessing me every day. Hey guys, welcome back to Educators Roundtable. If you're interested in being a guest here at Educators Roundtable, you can join us anytime. Send us a DM or you can sign up with us via our website. So listen, our, if you missed the first session, you missed a conversation about an amazing company that's doing rock star things in our school districts. And I don't know about you, but it's really important that we start shifting the way we think about how we need to educate our students and preparing them to either go to college, go to get some type of training and certification or go to work. So Shannon, I don't know, like this first half, I was really excited. Did Dr. Spinelli get you excited? She's so passionate about education. She is. She is. Um, and, and I would say not just passionate, but passionate and knowledgeable. And, and, and that's a yes. that's a really powerful combination. Absolutely. And I can't it wait is. to hear more. I know she's, I just, I love her. I think she's such a rock star. So Dr. Spinelli, I'm going to tell you, you are really focused on providing youth with the opportunity. And everyone has asked me, what is CompTIA? Can you please tell them what it is? Like what happens? What's going on? with? I know what it is. Shannon, do you know what it is before she tells us? Do you know what it is? No, I don't. Okay. <laughs> so there you go. So what is Comp? T.I., what is that? Well, come to you, I have to tell you, it is the first credential that's offered by a major $2.2 million credential. They give that many credentials per year. CompTIA. Okay, the CompTIA A-plus credential is the first in a series of credentials that lead to cybersecurity. And so it's, it's an entry-level vendor-neutral kind of a certification where kids learn how to fix things on the network, the internet of things, how to troubleshoot a computer, um, all of the initial things they need to really build themselves from novice to practitioner within the IT space. And there are two components of it. The first component, they master that, they take an assessment. And then the second component, they master that and they take, a, take an assessment. But I can't, I can't just tell you what CompTIA A plus is without telling you that we create success for every kid that's in our program. We don't just stick them in a course. We give them a laptop, they keep it after the program's over. It's embedded with the internet, it works. And so we don't have to worry about whether or not they have access to the internet. We give them Microsoft Office Suite. We connect them with an employer at the very beginning, at the onset of the program. We try to do cohorts of 30. And so we determine what time works for them. Oh, so you wanna do this on a Saturday morning? Cool, you better wake up because you gotta get credit for this. Oh, you wanna do this on a Wednesday evening? We can do it on any time you wanna do it collectively it's a set schedule. Once we agree to it, we're off one hour a week. And I they have it. mentors. They're learning the curriculum from it. And it's all virtual. They're learning from people who are professionals in this arena. The best. They get the cell number of the instructor and they get their own personal mentor. They get every class played back on the cell phone if they want to in case they didn't get it. We build success labs online and everything. When they walk out of this, this comp to your A plus credential, you ask what it is. It really is the credential that is required for almost every federal contract you might work on if you're employed by an IT company. Don't forget, every entity that operates as an organization has IT. Mm -hmm. We all know that we don't think about it, but and every entity needs this type of a person because if the network goes down or if it's not protected, you can't work. Mm -hmm. And so this person is skilled and walks away with, and let me say this again, industry standard credential. It's not just a piece of paper. It's something they can take anywhere. And, and Christine, I've got to say this. Mm -hmm. We don't care about just anybody taking this course. We only want to work with underserved populations. We want to work with kids that might have been labeled special ed. They're not. They're just special. We want to work with kids that people have they've given up on. We can work with regular kids. It doesn't matter. But we can start as young as 13. No high school diploma is required. And we can go as old as 95 if you feel like you still want to do it. It's not a problem. <laughs> I don't, Shannon, it sounds like you guys should have this in your school district. This is like totally rock star. It, it, it really does. And, and Dr. Spinelli, hopefully um, you can make some time for me offline so that we can have some conversation about 
what next steps in conversation might look like. Would love to. You know, and, and keeping what you just said, my mind goes back. I won't call the names of universities, but there are two schools that I met with, and they were interested in meeting with us because we create success. So their kids go through the CompTIA A plus credential, then it's the CompTIA Network Plus, and then the CompTIA Security Plus. Why well, is a stupid question? I always ask questions about numbers that tend to be stupid. How many kids got a credential? Zero from both colleges. So this goes not just you know, K-12, we could start as early as middle school, colleges, they have kids going through these courses and their excuse is they don't have the wraparound support. We provide mental health counseling too, if necessary. They don't have that. And my question is, why not? Because what you've done is turned a kid off from a whole pathway that they could be excited about and excel in. Obviously they were interested, they took the course. But obviously if they fail the exam, they're not interested. We don't allow failure. That exam, $3,500, by the way, it's not cheap. Unless you get a voucher, it could be three, 400. I love that. And I love what you're doing in, in that whole realm. And I think what people don't understand is there is a huge cost to this. But before I move any further, I'm going to tell you guys, she brought the whole game. Larry, what is going on? I am so excited Hi. to see you. I almost start doing cartwheels when I saw you in a green room. <laughs> I am happy to be invited. Thank you. Oh my gosh. I I mean, I can't even tell you. So like before we go into this question, I, Larry, I want you to share with people who you are and what you do in education. So they they so they'll understand who's because right now I feel like I should just be like doing this right now because people don't know who you are. <laughs> I don't even know if they understand, but go ahead, Larry. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for that opportunity. I always tell people that back when I started in education, I was the youngest principal in Texas. I was 24 years old, my first principal's job. And I never forget the first adult I met was the teacher that didn't get the principal job. Mm -hmm. So I started young and fast and uh, it was exciting. Uh, and then uh, for about uh, 15 years, I was in some school districts, uh, high poverty, uh, high low income, uh, high mobility and uh, bilingual schools. And so uh, I went to the other side of education after that. And uh, I say sometimes it's the vendor side of education, but it was really mm -hmm. focusing on implementation of some solutions and technology. Uh, and then uh, ended up uh, having the opportunity to lead some teams in both sales and in implementation and ultimately was a CEO of a curriculum mapping company, and that came by default. Uh, but uh, the investors asked me to, to take over and, and uh, help them expand uh, out in Chicago. Now I run my own professional services team, and I have a group of consultants that do amazing work in schools, uh, a lot of content in classroom management, student engagement, motivation, and I've worked with uh, Dr. Spinelli for uh, uh, in and out for a, a lot of years and learned a lot from her. And uh, I'm so excited uh, whenever she asked me to join hands with uh, what she's doing. I know. Isn't she? Let me tell you something. She's adorable. But Larry, you know, I love your accent. Every time I talk to you, you know I love your accent. So I'm not going to even hide it just because we're on a streaming platform. Michael, what are you doing? You know, seeing you in the green room, I was like, did he, is Michael really here? He's here. What is happening? I yes. feel like, I feel like singing all hell the king. How are you doing? I don't even know. Yeah. Should I be saying that right now? Like all hell the king. All hell the king. It, my, like my, that. Audio, my audio is horrible. Oh, we is hear you very audio, well. Do I need to do something with it? It's, it's, no. it's jumping. That's okay, but you, you sound good. So before we go any further, so Dr. Spinelli, you did have a question. Anissa says, and Anissa, thanks for much. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. She said, while IT is a great career path, our programs that introduce kids to healthcare careers and skill trades as prevalent. So is that, I mean, I think she's asking you, Dr. Spinelli, I could tell her what we're doing here in Michigan. I don't know what it looks like in every state, but 
they do have programs for each one of those, but they don't start at high school. They start after high school. Yeah, I did, I did hear the mayor in New York City talk today about a new uh, summer program that specifically aligns with health care fields. So I know New York is doing some pretty innovative things in that regard. Um, my focus has been IT because it's a pathway that has only a 4% minority participation. And I want to shake that tree. <laughs> Larry, you love it when she talks like that. We're going to shake that tree. <laughs> Dr. Mason, chime in. Thanks again, Dr. Mason, for joining us. You said this type of course is critical to workforce development. Everybody can benefit from this type of training. Thank you so much, Dr. Mason. Um, I'm going to tell you, I'm really excited because I think students need to understand what this looks like for them. So what job can a student apply for once they complete this IT training? I think you went over that a little bit before, yeah. uh, but what type of job can they get? A kid can actually become a cybersecurity specialist depending on the work that he's doing, his, his background. Um, and I, I found that in the research, I did not know that. And that's a salary around $130,000, typically a computer technician, an installation technician, an IT support specialist, a data support specialist, server support specialist, making sure there's visibility across networks, trying to fight cybersecurity attacks, and which are so prevalent these days, technical support, a field service technician, uh, network support specialist. They have all these little catchy titles, but if you were to go into the internet, into indeed.com, not that I'm doing an ad for them, and just type in top tier A+, plus, you'll see all of these jobs with salaries come down, and they're pretty they're pretty good, pretty good salaries that the kids could be making, could keep them out of trouble, that's for sure. I like that. So Larry, where you're at, do you still see the same need that she's seeing from this end as it relates to that type of IT, IT level one support in cybersecurity? Well, you know, I, I'm in the K-12 uh, industry uh, and, and the work that I'm doing is so, uh, when you talk about the cybersecurity part, I'll leave that to somebody with a lot greater expertise. But as far as the technology, you know, we've seen so many innovations that uh, promise and don't deliver. And uh, so uh, I'm excited about uh, what uh, Latanya's got going with with uh, some of the things she's doing with uh, parent power and engaging the whole community in their work. I'm also excited that Michael Pitts is on this, uh, uh, well, where'd he go? Well, Mike, Michael is here. I, I put him in the green <laughs> okay. room because yeah, Michael, I went, Michael. I went back to my phone because the, right. the, I couldn't hear anything. Oh, okay. Well, that's okay, but, Michael. Uh, that's, that's the reason why I put you in the green room so you could work it out first. Good. Right. I, I'm on my phone now so I can hear everybody. Okay, good. awesome. Yeah. So, but what I was going to say is I learned a lot from what he did as a school leader uh, in uh, several urban uh, urban schools, but also the books that he's been working on uh, and uh, in articulating in the area of technology. So uh, I think Michael would be uh, a, a better expert to answer that question you sent my way. Okay, so Michael, you already know you're coming on the show all by yourself. So just don't throw the whole book out there right now. Okay, okay. don't do it. It would be no reason for people to talk, to tune in when you come on by yourself, right? right? Don't do it. So so at a high level, Mike, just at a high level, right? Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about students learning this, getting get an opportunity to enroll in this IT certification program while they're in high school or middle school? What do you think about that? I always thought that was important for students to uh, be exposed to other um, venues other than just college track. Um, I think that students should be involved in trying to get certifications and also understanding um, why they take certain classes. A lot of times students take classes and they don't know what kind of job is affiliated with that class. It's perfunctory. And I've always said that, you know, if I'm trigonometry, why? You know, or other things, uh, if I'm taking computer type classes, to what end, to what job, what uh, what facilitates this kind of learning? And a lot of times uh, students are thinking that they're just taking it because it's a requirement. But um, I think in the IT space, that's the future. And uh, it's a lot of prerequisite classes to that. 
and students are taking it and they should understand how it links uh, because they're they're very important. I live in Memphis and uh, FedEx about 20, 30 years ago when I could have gotten some money in the FedEx and I, I didn't have any. Uh, they were hiring students out of high school to look up the internet and work on the internet. And I, I mean, they were paying them thirty, forty thousand dollars, and they weren't even out of high school yet. Okay, Mike. Uh, Mike, I think you just told your age though when you said look stuff. Oh, up I'm on old. Internet. I'm old. I'm not gonna. Right. You just you just threw it all out there. I just want to keep it real right now. I've been in the game for thirty some hard years, so you know. <laughs> uh, um. So you know, and 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 also the tracks. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm answering the question. The tracks also. Mm -hmm. Um, invite kids to look at alternative uh, uh, careers. Yeah, it does. You know, um, it does. A lot, of, a lot of us got into the IT game late. You know, um, yeah. we we act like we act like it was around, but it's it's a very new space. And um, you got you know, uh, I think that a lot of kids in school learn about technology as a end user tool instead of a tool that they can actually create themselves mm -hmm. and so my my goal is to uh get kids out of the end user space and into the actual development space which is where the money is and which is where the future is. so that's and, why and that's our next question our next question is in in, in the transition is is about salary you know kids they're quick to ask if i'm doing this how much money am i going to make and I'm going to tell you right now, New York has done an amazing job with the integration of technology, but also providing CTE programs that will help students understand how to be on that end user and, and be a developer and that concept behind that. So I'm going to say they're, they're like a really large school district, but there are individual schools out there within the New York school district who have done an amazing job with this. And I mean, they're like ahead of the, the district itself. Like they're doing some kick-ass stuff. So I just want to see, Shannon, I don't think you know that I look up what's going on in New York. I don't think you know I know that. Are you impressed right now? Hey, Larry and Mike, how you doing? I'm Shannon. How are you? <laughs> doing good. Are you impressed that I know what's going on in New I am, York? I am incredibly impressed. Yes, yes. Okay, so Mike and Larry, this is my co-host. This is this is my rock right here. We rock every Wednesday. So when you come on, Mike, it'll be this guy grilling you down about your book. He's gonna oh, be no. on you like a hawk. Great. <laughs> now you know. And only in a, only in a positive and supportive manner. Mike. Oh, hey, I, I, and, and Larry, nope. when you come on and we talk about all the training and development and support that you offer school districts with your program, it's going to be this guy that's going to be grilling you about what are you really offering? What changes have you made? How do you track performance and growth through what you do? It's going to be this guy. I'm just preparing you, right? He only comes on very innocent, but it's this guy. Only in a way that's positive and, and professional. <laughs> okay. I, I look forward to it. <laughs> it's, it's time we got real and told the truth out there. Yeah. You know, there yeah. We don't have time to waste. That's for sure. We don't, and that's that's what this this uh, platform is about is not wasting time. So here you go. The average salary uh, for an IT role coming out of this program, Dr. Spinelli, is what? What can kids expect to earn? The average is fifty eight thousand. It could be a little bit more. It could be a little bit less. Um, again, we find we find uh, jobs. Then. They don't have to look. We assign them to someone they can hire, and that person is monitoring them and giving them feedback along the way. We financial also and leadership, personal finance and leadership too. Uh, we provide those kinds of uh, lessons. So, also, guys, keep in mind what she's saying when there's a, a, a salary difference. A person working at a level one in cybersecurity in Michigan, their pay rate is going to be different than someone who works in New York. New York has a higher cost of living. Um, D.C. has a higher cost of living. California does. So when you look at it, you're probably thinking, oh, they're making eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 a year, but their cost of living. <laughs> Trust me, you'll be living in a shoebox. <laughs> makes well, ninety thousand a year. You add at least fourteen thousand eight hundred to New York, a place like New York. Exactly, and that's one thing. I just sometimes when kids look at that, they ask that question. Okay, so um, Mr. Pitts uh, mentioned prerequisites for IT training. What are they? Are are there free or low cost resources to get them? For our training, let me be clear, there are no prerequisites. We take you as you are. Right. 
and we okay. teach you everything you need to know. Right. Okay, so Mike, do you feel that there are some prerequisites that students need to know? Well, my my space is I, I, I come from the elementary level up. So my prerequisites are so far back that if I told you exactly oh, what you're I saying think, yo, your prerequisite is not for students to get certification. Kids. Do you think there's basic prerequisites yeah. she's asking? It is okay. It what is. do you think they are? Do you have a, a list of three or four? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly. Um, I, I come from the space where they get trained from the very beginning of uh, keyboarding on up to a, a higher level through schools and, and spreadsheet and other things. Whereas I think this program starts, uh, is this starting at high school? 13. 13 is middle school. Yeah, so my opinion on that is mm -hmm. that it's two, it's two tracks that go on in schools and and. and and uh, they're not totally in sync. Um, a lot okay. of people see uh, in the technology, as I said, as end users, others see it as bringing kids up from an actual curriculum where they understand keyboarding and all of these other things in the early grades. And as they progress through a academic curriculum, they go all the way to PowerPoint in grade four, in grade five and right. grade six, they actually create PowerPoints. In grade seven, they start uh, spreadsheeting. They start all these. And right now, it is wh whatever kid can do those things based on their parent input, based on a good teacher input. It's not an organized structure, even though there are organized curriculums to bring you up to get to that level. So. so Basically, there are no specific prerequisites other than exposing your kids to as much technology as possible. No, I allowing think there them are. to explore. That's, that's what's happening now. Yeah. But there are curriculums written that gets kids ready uh, by the age of 13 to move right into that. All right. So, Cook, what I'm going to tell you. Follow it. So, Cook, mm -hmm. what I'm going to tell you to do when Mike comes on, watch because he'll be talking to you from his book and he'll be outlining those things for you. Sure and just to let you know, his book will be available for sale, and you'll be able to purchase it during the show by going to his site. We're, I'm going to keep it real with you guys. The book is amazing, so you might want to get it so you can kind of look at life from a different lens. Jermaine, by the way, who is the vice president of ISACA in Washington, um, D.C. area, which is cybersecurity organization, um, he says, preach, Mike, preach, move from being a consumer to being an innovator. He is really big on that. And and please don't promote Mike right now. Mike does not need, you know, a bandwagon over here. I just want to say that to everybody. He does not need a bandwagon. Um, our next question is, what uh, state is the program currently available in at no cost for the youth, Dr. Spinelli? I know right now you do have the program in one state where kids can just sign up for it. Where is that? Uh, it's in Denver, uh, Denver, the mayor of Denver. And we, we are, first of all, a JTPL provider. So we are approved by the state of Colorado to provide this program. And the city of Denver has money set aside. So we're in the process of identifying those kids and getting them enrolled. When you talk about money, though, we just received a grant from Union Bank in Long Beach, California. Mm -hmm. the, DA, uh, the, the chief prosecutor for Long Beach wants this program as kind of a court intervention program for kids who've gone astray to put them back on track. And so he has two other programs that he currently has with this grant. He's going to add additional funding, resolve those programs, and they'll be doing strictly the virtual IT program. So these kids would complete the CompTIA A plus credential and not go before a judge. If they don't complete that credential, then they go through the court processes. So, but they don't pay. I like the fact that Denver decided to pay up front for these courses so that students can just enroll. So if you know anyone in Denver, please have them reach out to Dr. Spinelli so she can tell them how they can join a cohort of students for this program. And what else did you want to say, Dr. Yeah, Spinelli? One other one I forgot. We were just funded by the legislature in New York to launch a program in Suffolk County in collaboration with the Commissioner for Labor for Suffolk County. 
And so that money has already been approved. We're waiting on the legislature to stamp it and we'll be good to go. We will need kids in that program. I say kids, we go as high as 24 when we group ages 13 to 24 for this program. However, we can do adults too, it doesn't matter. I like this. So Larry, what, what is the process that school districts or municipalities can go through in order to provide this program for free to the students? So, so you're, yeah, you're asking me a funding question. Yes. The Community Reinvestment Act, everybody has to set aside a certain percentage of its funds, and I think it's two or three percent, for closing the digital divide in low to middle income communities. Every bank has this money. When they fail to do so, they are sanctioned by the FDIC. Be careful what you ask for, you just might get it. Because if you don't ask for this funding, you don't get it. But wherever you deposit your money, that bank has money set aside to pay for these kinds of programs. Programs that are targeting, closing the digital divide for the kinds of kids we enjoy serving, low to middle income. Okay, so Dr. Spinelli, say that one more time for us. So people understand how they can get this program funded in their state. They need to go to where? I'll tell you very simplistically. It's called the Community Reinvestment Act. Thank it you. Is legislated. It is not up for conversation or negotiation. It is a fact. And when banks refuse to put this money in the right places to close the digital divide for people who are in low to middle income communities, they are sanctioned by the FDIC and they don't play. They can shut you down. And so there are banks, I won't name them, that have been sanctioned. And those would be the very first ones to go to. It's, it's in the press, you can see it. And you know what's interesting? They can do several things. They can give a grant. That's what you'd be looking for. Mm -hmm. They can pay for unsubsidized housing, mm -hmm. construction, et cetera. And they can do small business loans. We're not talking about those two. We're talking about that free category where you have a group of kids that can benefit from this program and you go to the bank and you have this conversation with the president of the bank. And if you don't walk out of there with it, then maybe you should be depositing your money someplace else. I love it. So my next question is how do students enroll in CompTIA program? How do they enroll? Yeah, we have a toll free number and they simply call that number or log on to the website. We have an enrollment form there. W and what's your website? What's w the name w of your company? It, and, you know, the www dot is always there. So ed, E-D, as an education, dash tech, T-E-C-H, group, dot com. Edtechgroup.com is the name of the company. It's a blend of education and technology. Okay. And so students, if you want to enroll and you're watching this, you need to go to our website at edtech, which is E-D slash tech group. Dot com. So how many students can um, enroll Dr. Spinelli in the program? Do you guys have cohorts? Yeah, we, we try to do cohorts of 30. Uh, it doesn't have to be 30. Uh, if we had 20 students, we could we could move forward with the cohort and begin. Um, we also have a toll-free number. You can feel free to dial that number too. It's 800-380-6836. Okay, and once the podcast is completed, you guys will be sure to um, post that information on our social media site so you can reach out to them anytime you like. And I know one of the things the parents are going to ask is, is the program accessibly, is it virtual? They want to know, do they have to come to the class or can they just log on and their kid can take the class? I'm glad you asked that question for clarification. This is a virtual program. Everything is virtual. You don't have to go anywhere. In fact, the credential class, the test, the exam is virtual also. So we give each student a computer, and it has internet, and it has Microsoft Office Suite. Each student keeps that computer at the end of the class. It's yours. I love you that. To go to work, or you'll need it for other reasons. And Shannon, so, I, we definitely need this in New York and Michigan. I'm, I'm bringing her to Michigan. Agreed. Agreed. Right? Absolutely. I'm bringing her to Michigan. I mean, the time to, re to reimagine what education can look like for, for all is now. Um, now more than ever. And the window is closing quickly. So yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, Shannon, it, I love that. See that again, the time to reimagine. Now, uh, I am paraphrasing. Um, 
chance for David Banks on that first <laughs> part. But I will say this: the window was closing quickly. Is is all Shannon? Because I think I think as we, you know, these these institutions are massive, and there's institutional momentum that will take us back to doing things the way we used to very quickly. And uh, the past two years will be a memory. Um, and and we mm-hmm. need to actively move against uh, kind of what didn't work and let those things go and embrace what makes sense for those uh, coming up. Uh, Jermaine says, repeat the website. Jermaine, I'll be happy to text that over to you shortly as soon as the podcast is over. And also make sure I put it out on all of our social media sites. I'm going to tell you, I know you said, you know, you kind of took that one liner and you put your own spin on it. But I'm telling you right now, that's a movement. We need to reimagine. The time is now to reimagine education. I feel like that's a T-shirt, right, Dr. Spinelli? That's it a is. It, it really is. And it's just it's near and dear and very close to my heart. I've always mm-hmm. been in the box. And Larry, I was a principal in Atlanta at 23. And uh, I had kindergarten kids who were proficient in Kiswahili and Spanish. Forget about that. They were doing algebra trig, multiplying fractions, square roots, decimals, and percents, performing around the state of Georgia. They were going into my fourth grade classes, showing my fourth grade students how to subtract and regroup and divide with teachers in the back of the room. And so I just shudder to think if we could get over our own idiosyncrasies and come out of the box with something that kids are so ready for. They're ready. Sometimes we're not. We need to get ready because these kids deserve to be in IT among other things. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you, if I wasn't on board, you just sold me. I'm, <laughs> you just sold me. If, if I was like an educator in the classroom, I would be on board with you right now. So I think what everybody's gonna be asking me is how can they contact and get more information on the program? Folks, you wanna go to ed slash tech, yeah. te- a little, put the I- little line, like a little minus, a minus, ed mm-hmm. minus tech, Okay, tech at group.com. I, again, I'm going to put it on all of our social media sites. So trust me, I want you to be able to reach out to her. She made it very clear to you guys tonight. They need to go to their banks and ask for what? What's the name of the program again? See, a CRA grant, Community Reinvestment Act. It's called a CRA grant. And given the fact that there is only a 4% minority population in the IT sector, uh, that's reason enough to be funded. Uh, I was in Virginia and I saw Capital One Bank just cut a check to an organization for $380,000. And they were simply, these kids, the only task was to take computers apart and put them back together again. That was it. Wow. Banks will pay. Capital One certainly has risen to the occasion of funding programs for low to middle income students. Hats off to Capital One. Our last question for the evening is, what is the average cost per student for this program? The average cost, and it depends on the number of students, will run from five to $8,000 per student. Keep in mind, we're giving away the computer, we're giving away internet, we're giving away everything. Uh, as a matter of fact, I did mention that the first class is CompTIA A+. Yes. But once a student enrolls, that student can go back and take every course in the spectrum all the way through cybersecurity at no additional cost. Wow. Folks, I'm going to tell you now, if you don't have your student interested or in really focused on anything that they want to do, this is a great opportunity. I want to say thank you to uh, Michael, who's going to be coming back. I know you guys have a lot of questions for Michael, but um, tonight we're talking about CompTIA, and this is not the Michael Pitt show. (laughs) But what I'm going to do is I'm bringing you back, Michael, because obviously you have fans. So we want to make sure that they can talk to you because people have questions right and so we want them to be able to talk to you and so larry people want to know more about what you're doing and training and development for staff there's a huge opportunity i'm sure in every state um to see what you can do to help teachers during this transition because a lot of them are still in virtual or hybrid right and there's just a great opportunity for you guys to see what you can do to help them so folks we are going to invite they want to hear more from larry and mike but they also want to hear more about uh comptia and the other thing is, I think, you know, before we end the show, I want to make sure, Shannon, with what you guys are doing in New York, and I just want to applaud you guys. You guys put a lot of thought behind building each of your schools independently 
I mean, you put a lot of thought, which is really rock star amazing how you manage your portfolio of schools. And I just want to share that. Like, how do you guys, you know, put together those pieces? And even after you transition through leadership, you still manage to run those school districts. I mean, you got some school districts. I'm going to tell you right now, you got some of the highest performing school districts in the country, in New York. Um, we, we, we do. Um, and the secret is in the funding. The, the funding lies with those building principles. Um, and that's that's something that that doesn't happen in many other places. And so um, when you have a high performing principal who is in control of the financial, the, the, the time and, and the human resources, amazing things can happen. But it's it, it really is the funding structure that makes that possible. And I, I like that you share that. I think that's something that a lot of people don't know is that just when when Dr. Spinelli was in those schools, it was her that made the difference. She was an out of the box thinker. So if you're listening right now and you're a leader with Shannon is saying, yeah, New York is a great school district, but it's those individual leaders within those schools that are bringing that additional funding to their buildings and they're out of the box thinkers. That's the reason why they have so many high performing schools in areas that are underserved. And when I tell you those kids and I go and study your data, you guys are knocking it out the box. Heroes, heroes. And and, and our it. um our graduation and, and attendance and test data was released actually today and we've we've increased uh yeah it, it it's I'll, I'll send you the information it, it's actually pretty spectacular okay so, so from my understanding <laughs> overall you guys had a 30 a 32 percent increase with most school districts during this time had a decrease so um i don't want to start quoting direct numbers <laughs> uh, let me let me let me let me just say i saw it today for the first time and um I'll follow up with you and we can come back and do a deep dive if need be. We're ha we'll have to do a deep dive because I'm going to say overall, the averages from your schools was very impressive versus schools across the United States during this pandemic. And they are the only school district in the United States that never shut down. They were full face to face the entire time. They offered accommodations to students, but overall they were open. And I'm, I'm very impressed with you guys. You stood your ground on that. Um, and it, it, it actually was uh, not always the popular choice, yeah. but we, we we know black and brown kids need to be in schools. Yes, they do. Like, like, and I'm, you know, and, and let's just, all kids need to be in schools. Right. But that population specifically needs to be in schools for a lot of reasons that, that honestly don't even involve reading and writing and arithmetic. Right. But absolutely. And we can talk about that as well. Oh, we, we definitely are talking about that. A lot of times I always think my co-host and I, and we often do have a show without guests because we have so much to talk about. <laughs> we we'll just go. We're having a show without guests this week. But I want to thank all my guests for coming on this week. Michael, you will be coming back and we're going to showcase your book so we can talk about what you're doing in education today and how you're shifting the minds of people in the future. And Larry, we're going to bring you. you back. Um, to our podcast. We want to talk to you more about how you can support teachers in the classroom. He's been in New York City schools too, by the way. His company yeah. Business. yeah. Oh, yeah. And I'm, that's what I'm saying. I'm just really You're, you're in New York City schools, Larry? Yeah. Yeah, we, we're servicing some of the schools and, and, and the high schools. And just to add what's been said, uh, one of the, one of the uh, niches, I think, that New York has figured out uh, is uh, where kids focus on a career path that they enjoy. And I'll name a few schools that, I, that I've uh, walked in and seen. Uh, the uh, Life Academy uh, there in Brooklyn is uh, focusing on the arts. Um, you have uh, uh, sports management where these, uh, these uh, high school students can learn uh, what it, uh, not just going as an athlete, but how you can go in and support teams in whatever sport that they are playing. And they're learning, they have to have the prerequisites of math and reading and literacy and all of those things uh, to, to transition, but they're learning the skill sets uh, to uh, go into a career, go into a job. Uh, and, and, and these are not massive high schools out in Phoenix. Uh, it's like a college campus, 3,000, 5,000, 6,000 students, uh, you know, they get lost along the way. But uh, New York's doing some great things. And I was excited to hear uh, Shannon uh, is leading that way. Oh, yeah. He's the rock star. 
And he has so much to share and so many positive things to add to what's going on in New York. So, Larry, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you back mm -hmm. in a couple of weeks. Mike, thank you for joining us. Dr. Spinelli, as always, you know, you're welcome to come back anytime. Pleasure. Because we love what you're doing over there at EdTech Group and we want the world to know. Don't forget, guys, right now the program is free in what state? In Colorado. It, oh. it's free. And um, we're getting ready to do something in Delaware that would make it free for those students also licensed there. All right. So don't forget, guys, you got to oh, tune yeah. in. And, and make sure that you guys, when I post her information, you guys follow up with her. Thank you so much, Dr. Spinelli, for joining us here at Educators Roundtable. And Shannon, let me just say, as always, you know, I'm always happy to see you. We can just do a show just you and I chit chatting it up. We could. We could. And we have. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> About our education hot topics. So, Shannon, I will see you next week and keep doing what you do. Continue to be outstanding in the state of New York and rocking it out for the kids. We very much appreciate you. And as we always say, our teachers are our heroes. So thank you teachers everywhere for doing what you do that's so amazing and shifting and shaping the minds of our future. See you next week, guys.